Tonight, our speaker is an environmental educator that specializes in introducing young children to nature with hands-on learning outdoors. Uh, that must be why she's so patient with me. That's all I can say. <laughs> Donna made the move to Lake County from Oklahoma two years ago, where her greatest honor were bringing four different groups of children to Washington, D.C. to receive the Presidential Environmental Youth Award under four presidential administrations. Tonight, she's excited to share just a few of the birds that call Lake County home. She's the vice president of Lake County's Red Bud Audubon Society and is Lake County's Nest Watch and a California Bluebird Recovery Coordinator as well as my neighbor and friend, which I really appreciate her patience with me because I come to her over and over going, can you tell me what those brown birds up there are? Well, thank you, Judy. You know why, that she's used to dealing with children. Yay. I, I am, so this will be interesting. Go right ahead, Donna. Okay, I'm going to share screen and hopefully, you all see bird watching around Clear Lake? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, it was really hard to put this together because there are so many wonderful birds here. I mean, birds are my life. I can't stop thinking about birds, looking at birds, and living here in Clear Lake is like a dream come true every day. Uh, so I thought I'll just go with the birds that were seen in the largest numbers during our Christmas bird count. Um, in December. Not only will you see just one of these species if you go out birding, but you could see thousands. So we will start here. Uh, most of these pictures are mine. That's why they're not the top that you'll see. Uh, there are so many great photographers in our county. Let's see, I need to go to from the beginning. And let's see, it's not advancing to the next slide. Okay, I guess I'll have to just click. Uh oh, you guys aren't seeing that though. From beginning, I'm screen sharing. I hit the little guy at the bottom. Can I have some guidance? I don't, oh, there it goes. Okay, there you go. this, um, on Facebook, I found Bruce's pictures and it's just amazing. So many people are such good photographers in this county that um, they just bring the birds to life. So on social media, just glancing through uh, Facebook, you're going to see pictures of like this golden eagle picture is just amazing. Um, my favorite birding spots that I love, I'm not advancing on mine. Let me see from the beginning. Are you guys all seeing birding hotspots on your screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I live here with Judy and Debbie and Pam and a lot of people over in the Clear Lake Oaks Keys. Uh, this is an amazing area. Every day I can get 30 to 40 different species just walking within a mile. Um, right off my back deck, if I were just to keep walking, I'd be in the water. So this is just like heaven for me. So I did this presentation on if someone was to come visit me, and we planned the day, our whole itinerary would start right here, right in my house. And we would just start walking and then we'll get in the car and go to Anderson, which everybody has probably been to Anderson. And then we're gonna stop off at Clear Lake State Park and Peace and Plenty Farm, which is a, a birding spot that I didn't even think about, um, but they have seven acres and you can easily see a hundred birds on their couple acres. And then my favorite place is um, the Lake County Land Trust Rodman Preserve. And I, I can't imagine a place I'd rather live than at the preserve. Uh, for the presentation, I took the top 10 spot the species that we saw. And December 19th, uh oh, my screen didn't advance. Did yours? No. no. How no. come you? Are you, you're still seeing the burning hot spots? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Hmm. Well, while we're still seeing this, this is Gay Henry, and I just want to say that there's a site on Facebook called uh, Burning California and the West. And if you click on that, you'll see a lot of incredible Lake County photographers that are sharing their sites, their birds all the time. 
They are amazing. And Gay, you've had some fantastic ones that I've loved, especially like your Fame of Pepla. Well, thank you. But I'm, I mean, there's this, this Bruce guy. He's, yeah. uh, he's, all, he's all over the place. And when I, once I clicked on that, it's like, oh man, these are wonderful pictures that are posted on a daily basis on Facebook. I agree. Bird, California birding and, and, and the West. Fabulous. Okay. Well, a lot of uh, them are right from here. Here's, the, here's are just a few. Um, and can you imagine just going out for in a couple of hours? We had uh, groups of birders around the lake, and they counted over 27,000 greaves, over 11,000 ruddies. So it's not like you're going to just see one or two birds if you're if you have your eyes open, you're going to see so many. Um, so here we go. We're starting out at day one. We're going to get up early at 730 and we're going to go have our little espresso over at Marcel's. It's a cute little drive through. We, you can get your coffees right there. Um, and then oh, we're going to bird walk in the Keys. We'll walk down to Judy's house. And by the time I get down to the end of Keys Boulevard, we'll have 40 different species, I bet. Um, get back in the car and we're gonna, well, I said we'd walk out to Clark's Island and go off to the pier. These are just places right in my little area that they didn't mention in our um, training. And then if we're hungry, we'll stop off for breakfast at the country kitchen. And then by nine o'clock, we will go, first we'll probably go out to Lisa's place and walk around there. She has kayaks that you can rent. And in April, she's going to have actual motor boats. Um, and uh, let's see. It's interesting because my screen, I'm actually having to physically push the button to advance it. But that's OK. And then a half day um, after we go to Anderson and Audubon Sanctuary, um, the McVicker Reserve, which is close to 1,000 acres, I think, um, we'll bird walk all Anderson. McVicker, and then we'll go over to the state park, and then Peace and Plenty will stop to bird and get lunch, and then go on over to Rodman in the afternoon. And after Rodman, we'll go to the Reclamation Ponds and Bloody Island, and then drive up High Valley Road and see vistas and stop off at Brassfield and then do a little historical as we come down the mountain at Red and White and go to the community church. I have pizza right next door to me, so cool, but there's Osprey that every day about 4.30 or 5, he'll go land on the sailboat mast next door at my cousin's house and spend the night there. So if you need to see Osprey, I can always find Osprey. And then 7 o'clock, we'll do rest and relaxation, and then 9 o'clock, um, we will just walk outside and view the night sky with telescopes. So Anybody that comes to visit me is outside almost all day. And then we'll actually start our birding. I wonder why my, it's just not advancing. A lot of people wonder, you know, where can I see a bird? Um, and there's everywhere. You can look on the ground. If you can see it at the feeder, swimming in the water. And some people just seem to have a sixth sense for locating birds. but. But don't be fooled, there's no real wizards in birding. All it takes is practice. Uh, finding birds is just being aware and knowing where to look. And if you're outside, just stop, look around, listen, and look at the birds. Are they on the ground, at your eye level, in the sky? And if you were trying to ask me, you know, where, what is that bird? You'd have to tell me, like, I use the clock. And I, if it's at like one o'clock, I'll know to look up there. Or if it's at six o'clock, it'd be on the ground. So just little clues make it a little bit easier um, to bird. So let's get into the actual birds. Let's see if it advances. Most all of you probably know your mallard. Mm -hmm. um, the male and female, the male has brightly colored head and and then next to this one over here is the ready duck. These are here in such huge numbers right now. Our ducks can be dabblers or divers. And our dabbling ducks rarely dive and they forage on land. 
the majority of their diet is going to be plant material. And let's see. They like to eat um, stems and roots and variety of little plants, especially the pond weeds. And they'll even eat seeds, acorns, and waste grain. But they'll also eat the insects, tadpoles, frogs, and small fish. And then our cute little ruddy ducks. If you see a, a bunch of ducks low on the water and you can't really even make out what they are and there's a big group of them, right now most likely they're ruddy ducks. They're smaller duck, low to the water, and they usually keep their tail pointed up, so that's a good sign. They're divers. They're going to forage by diving and swimming underwater for seeds, roots, insects, and then they use their bill to strain out items from the muds at the bottom. And here's our first um, pause. We're going to do a little door prize. And I believe in chat, you'll write your answer. So, and I believe our administrators will decide who is the <laughs> winner of a great prize. But the question is, can you name the conservation organization that holds monthly meetings and a yearly celebration of nature featuring boat tours that offer a rare opportunity for participants to see nature up close on beautiful Clear Lake? And the winner of this Question, will receive a one-year membership to National Audubon Society and one of our Redbud Audubon t-shirts. So I guess Michelle or so someone looks, else. Looks, looks like Robert got that one first. Well, congratulations, Robert. Um, Clear Lake is, people come from all over the world actually to come see our greaves. We have Western and Clark's Greaves that breed here on the lake in large numbers. And they're renowned for their ballet-like courtship displays in which the males and the females run across the water. Their long necks are curved in the S shapes. These uh, water birds rarely come ashore. Instead, they take long dives to catch fish or other aquatic insects. Um, they were considered to be the same species until 1985 when scientists observed that the two species rarely interbreed, despite sometimes living on the same lakes. Uh, it's easy to tell them apart, especially with binoculars. They make different calls and have substantial DNA differences if you're gonna really get into it. And May is a great month to watch them do their dance. And have all of you seen this dance? Um, a good place to see it is always at any of the places where they're putting their boats in the water. Um, one of my favorite birds that I have all over the Keys. Right, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's actually called rushing. They rushing? rush. That's pretty, yes. thank you. Um, the double-crested comorants, uh, we actually have them nesting here at the entrance to the uh, lake from the Keys. And from a distance, the double-crested comorots are dark birds with just snaky necks. But up close, they're so colorful. They have orange-yellow skin on their face and throat and striking aquamarine eyes that just sparkle like jewels. And their mouth, it has this bright blue on the inside, if you're lucky enough to see that. Um, most of you probably all are familiar with the Canada goose. Um, they feast on sedges and grains and berries and aquatic vegetation. When you think of um, birds, these guys can be from six pounds to 20 pounds, and their wingspan is over five feet. And something interesting about them is they will mate for life. Uh, let's go down. I wish mine was advancing. Um, here are some more of the grebes that we have on the water. Um, although flighted to escape danger, the grebes are usually going to dive underwater. Even when you go by in your kayak, they'll dive. Uh, the migratory pied bill grebes fly at night. Although I, for some reason, and Gay, you might um, chime in on this, but I've had pied bills all year here. Do you have that at um, Anderson also? Henry, you should speak up about that, but you need to unmute yourself. Or, or she can check in later. But I, we have grebes here in the Keys all year, the pie bills. Um, yes, yeah, so this, 
This is gay. We have pie bills. In fact, this last year, we had, um, they're supposed to be secretive. Uh-huh. And you never see them. All you do is hear them going, ooh, 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 ooh. but we actually had a nest right off of our dock, which made it not secretive, but fabulous. And you can see in the picture on the lower left that you've got there, that the babies have this incredible coloring. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, I, and that, that's something interesting because I had them right here in one of the canals too, and I had not heard them being here all year, but there's quite a few of them still here now. Uh, right, and, and the, other thing that's interesting, the other thing that's interesting about them is that their voice is what you think of when you think of the old Tarzan movies and the uh, hoo, 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 hoo. that's actually a high build grebe sound that they used yeah. Yeah. because they they the, the 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 monkeys didn't make the sound they wanted so the sound guy in the 1930s said how about using this so the sound of every in every Tarzan movie that you think is the monkey is actually a pie build grebe <laughs> that's cute um, yeah. the, the pie bills are really strong flyers um, but to take off from water, they need a really long, long runway to take off. Um, and then you see the eared grebes and horn grebe. This horn grebe that I have pictured here is in breeding plumage. And again, they're just they're just beautiful birds. Um, but our pie bills are not secretive here in the Keys either. So maybe things are changing. Right. And the other thing about pie bill grebes that's amazing is that they, uh, like a submarine, will just sink down. Yeah, they, don't they just suddenly sink down, and it has something to do with how they control their feathers. I'm not quite sure. Pretty interesting, and they're they're so nondescript, really. When you just are looking at the water, it's like you don't realize how special they really are. Exactly, exactly. Um, so most people are always um, ready and noticing our American white pelicans. Uh, they can, I think there were, were there 17,000 or something like that that they counted in the um, Christmas bird count. They're here in large flocks in the winter. And as everybody knows here, they're the large water bird with long yellow bill with an extendable pouch for scooping the fish out of the water. The breeding adults have a vertical plate near the tip of their bill. And both male and female have this horn that sheds before the ha- eggs hatch in midsummer. Um, a pelican can live 15 to 25 years, and they're sexually mature at ages three to five. Um, let's see, and that's this one. At the water's edge, you'll usually see these two birds. On the left is the belted kingfisher. They're kind of, they have a raggedy crest and they're powder blue and gray. Uh, the males will have one blue band across the white breast, whereas the females have a blue and a chestnut band. The female is more brightly colored and that's kind of unusual in the bird kingdom. Usually it's the male that's more colorful. Um, something interesting about kingfishers is as nestlings, the belted kingfishers have acidic stomachs that help them digest their bones and fish scales and the arthropod shells. But by the time they leave the nest, their stomach chemistry apparently changes and they begin regurgitating pellets which accumulate on the ground around where you can find them fishing and roosting. And remember in high school, we all got to dissect owl pellets, which should most likely been cleaned for you. So it's really exciting to go out and find kingfisher pellets and break those apart and see what they're eating. Um, You'll see lots of black Phoebes and they actually say their name, Phoebe, Phoebe. And they'll go out from a perch and then come back in. And uh, occasionally, uh, they're they're mainly um, insect feeders, but, and they'll hover in the same spot they, um, uh, something interesting, let's see. The female decides where to place the nest and does all the construction. They're territory and territorial and solitary nesters. And again, they're here year round. Uh, something, a collective nouns for flycatchers could be an outfield of flycatchers, a swatting of flycatchers, a zapper or a zipper of flycatchers. Zipper. 
There's a clear flag of tears. Um, also at the water's edge, a very noisy bird that most all of you will come in contact with are the red-winged blackbirds. They're always communicating vocally and visually. And the male's red wing will utter their songs. I don't think they're quiet very often at all, at least especially not around us. We have them all in the Thule's in my part of the canal. Um, let's see. As a pre-mating call, which I'm hearing a lot of right now, they, they make like a teet, teet, teet and is uttered by both of the sexes. I think a lot of people don't pay attention to the female because the male is so striking in his bold colors, but she's really very beautiful. And then also so numerous in the keys, every day, all day, I'll see um, a great blue heron, which can be 79 inches. They live in both freshwater and saltwater habitats. And they're going to forage in grasslands, even in the fields, and they'll stop frogs and mammals. And it's amazing to see how large a fish these guys will catch. I saw, well, I have a picture of um, one of them. The bullfrog must have been, I don't know, I'll say six inches and had long legs and they kept mm. it kept throwing it up so that it could get the head in first and then she, they gulped it all down pretty interesting to watch and same with the fish they'll take a gigantic fish that's bigger than their head and flip it to where that they can get it coming down head first so i guess that the scales go down easily and you can watch it go down their throat all the way down it's really interesting um the same with Donna, the uh -huh. Donna, they also come to our vineyard, but only when the grass is pretty low and they will come in and land. And I think they're looking for gophers. Oh, that's so cool. That'd be really interesting to watch me to gopher. Yes, they eat gophers too. They're really uh, voracious. It, it's interesting that you can see them here in Clear Lake. And then when you go out to the ocean, they're going to be there too. Um, the uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. great blue herons, they can hunt during the day and night. They have a really high percentage of rod photoreceptors in their eyes that improve their night vision. So it's, I guess it kind of helps when the territory, since they can keep fishing at night and then the great egrets kind of take them out over in the morning. Uh, our great egrets are really slow flyers but they're very powerful. They just do two wing bit beats per second and cruise around at 25 miles an hour. And if you ever watch these guys and even the snowy egrets and black crowned night herons catching their prey, they kind of twirl their feet and kind of move the mud around. And then they'll take a little step and do a little twirl and then they'll stab their prey. And then of course they try to swallow it head first. So just sitting and watching these guys eat is pretty amazing. Uh, we have quite a few snowy egrets still here in our canals, which are just smaller than the great egret. And it was, they're so cute because they have these bright yellow feet. So it's kind of cute. Um, here right now, especially at my house, because I put out uh, sugar water every other day, um, I have lots of hummingbirds. I think today I had 11 and even though they'll fight at the feeders, I have five feeders. So we kind of have harmony. The Anna's hummingbird, if you see a hummingbird, it's probably going to be an Anna's. They're the most common hummingbird along the Pacific coast. And they're very, males are very strikingly beautiful when the sun hits them just right. Uh, they're no larger than a ping pong ball and no heavier than a nickel. And right now you can hear them, uh, they, the males will climb up to 130 feet in the air and then they'll swoop down to the ground. And when they come down, they make a curious burst that you'll just hear is kind of loud and they're producing this uh, with their tail feathers. That's kind of a, a, a mating ritual that they like to do. Let's advance. Ooh, we have crows and ravens and I'm actually training I call my crows Buddy. I have three buddies and in the morning I'll go out and say, hey buddy. And they'll actually come sit in the tree next to the deck and I'll um, 
crush open walnuts for them and they'll come eat the walnuts. I'm trying to get it to where they'll come and get it out of my hand, but we aren't quite there yet. Um, some crows use tools, but they're also making tools. So that's pretty cool. Especially it's fun to watch them try to crack their own walnuts. I'll roll walnuts out into the front of the driveway and they'll swoop down and then they'll get them and they'll go to the top of the light pole and drop them until it cracks open. It's just really fun to watch. Um, uh, we have ravens here. Our ravens are as big as red tail hawks uh, and crows are about the size of pigeons. The raven is all black and has a three and a half to four foot wingspan. And the crow is also black, but it's only like two and a half feet in wingspan and only 17 inches long. Uh, when I read Kate Marion Child's book, um, she mentioned that when a crow dies, its neighbors may have a funeral. The sight of a dead crow tends to attract a mob of a hundred or more crows that are in the area. And during this ritual, the live crows will never touch the dead one. So that kind of leaves out scavenging as a, a motive. And people were wondering, now why do they do this? And they think it may be a survival strategy. The birds are learning about threats and they seem resistant to revisit that spot where they've encountered a dead crow, even if the food is plentiful there. I've only seen um, gatherings of like 20, but I think it'd be pretty awesome if you could see hundreds of birds. I mean, you can hear them when they're all so excited and they all come in, but that's, crows are just amazing. I don't know if I want a raven to land on me, but I do have an uncle that has a, he calls it a pet raven. Of course, you can't have a real pet, but you have to be brave. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Is it still okay? Okay. Um, in the air, usually you will um, see one of our most colorful raptors. It's the American kestrel. The male has a slate blue head and wings, and it's a little bit rusty red on the back. Uh, the female has the same warm reddish on her wings, back and tail. They're out hunting for insects and other small prey. And you'll usually see them perching on the wires or poles or hovering facing in the wind. And if you go to, to the reclamation ponds, I think there's two pairs that are um, always there. And I know I've seen them out at Anderson and of course they're at Rodman and Clear Lake State Park too. And, oops, we're not advancing, that's good. Oh, one of the most numerous and wonderful birds that are always around here in the Keys, but most people will never see or pay attention to are the black crowned night herons. They live in fresh salt and brackish wetlands and are the most widespread heron in the world. Black crowned night herons, um, they're kind of, they call them stocky birds compared to many of their long limbed heron relatives and they're most active at night or dusk. And they make the most interesting sounds. <laughs> um, we, I think I lived here for probably three days before I really started noticing the herons in the trees. They'll just sit right there. You'll, you could be like within 10 feet of them and they aren't gonna move. So they're very interesting. I love that, that kind of herons. Their sound is like a quark. Quark, quark. Cute. They're very yeah. messy, though. Not really great to have in your yeah. trees on your right. patio. <laughs> right. Uh, then we have um, the Northern Harrier or Marsh Hawk that I see every time I go to Anderson. And same with the reclamation ponds. It's a slim, long tailed hawk, usually gliding low over the grasslands and marshes. And it holds its wings in a V shape. And I guess the most distinguishing thing is, is the white patch that you're going to see. Um, they kind of have an owl-like face if you get a chance to look at them up close. And they're eating, um, I guess it, they could take something as large as a rabbit, but they'll also eat songbirds and reptiles. And I would assume over at um, Anderson, there's plenty of mice for them and squirrels. And now 
we have a Peace and Plenty Farm, which is a place that you wouldn't think would be great to bird watch. But so you pull into their little parking lot and it's like a little farm stand, but they have seven acres that has a creek in there. And Simon, one of the owners, is an ornithologist. So if you wanted someone, an expert, to go birding with you, uh, he'll walk with you and walk along the creek and you could easily get 50 to 100 birds, you know, within a half hour. It's, it's a great place to bird. And of course, while you're there, you'll want to shop. It's a place where you can always get really fresh produce. I'm not sure if, um, has the CTA ever gone out and toured their property? Uh, that'd be really interesting. They're gonna, um, especially if you could walk the full seven acres, something's always going on there. It's pretty interesting. Um, and then also in the air, everywhere around the whole lake, you're going to find ospreys. Like right now, I know for sure there's one sleeping next door um, on the mast, which is so cool. Uh, fish is by far the most important part of their diet, but they've been recorded catching a lot of other prey, including birds, reptiles, and crustaceans. We usually see their nests located on the man-made um, poles, and the osprey is one of the world's most widely distributed birds. Uh, if you go to the Broadman Preserve at the Land Trust, there's actually a nest, uh, well, there's two, three that I can think of that um, when they're nesting, it's great to go out and see them. Donna, there's Is, one There's one at the entrance to Vigilance. It, does anyone know how many uh, nests there are around the lake? I've only been here, you know, less than two years and I, I would be interested to know how many there are. We have one right across from um, the chamber from uh, Vista Point. I yeah. think I've um, counted 15 so far. So it's, that's awesome. That's a beautiful bird. The thing well, that's interesting, the thing that's interesting about these birds that I always cracks me up is that whenever they catch a fish, they'll take the time to turn it so that when they fly, it's head first and it's aerodynamic. So that's, that's a conscious decision that they're making. It's a totally conscious decision and it just cracks me up, but they always do that. <laughs> well, every picture you see, the fish is always watching where they're going. That's right. That's why they turn them around. If they catch them the other way, they, they, they take the time to turn them so that it's, I guess it's more aerodynamic when they fly. Could be. Um, <laughs> A bird that I think is overlooked is the turkey vulture. Um, they're our only scavenger bird that can't kill their prey. A close inspection of their feet kind of looks like a chicken instead of a hawk or an eagle. And their feet are useless for ripping into prey. But the vultures have powerful beaks and they can tear through even the toughest cowhide. They're related to a stork. They can fly 200 miles a day they're two and a half feet in length, I mean, tall, well, two and a half feet, with a six foot wingspan and weigh about three pounds. And they can live to be 20 years old. And I believe there is a nest at the Rodman Preserve. I've, I've seen young two years in a row, um, but I don't know of any other nests in the county. And then, oops, let's go back up here. And fast forward. To our second question, can you name the Lake County business globally known for harvesting this beautiful fall blooming flower with purple petals, yellow stamen, and three-part red orange stigma? <laughs> name the culinary herb, flower, and business, and the prize is one gram of saffron. You can run out to peace and plenty and pick it up, and can you tell it? Did anyone guess what the name of this business is? Yes. So Susan got in first. Awesome. It's a little typo, but I know what she meant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess saffron is has amazing properties. Um, it's supposed to cure depression, calm your nerves, um, along with using it in all the wonderful dishes. Um, if we advance here, 
If I run over something, you guys just tell me to slow down or stop. You're fine. Okay. Um, in the air, we have bald eagles and red tail hawks. It's kind of interesting when they are talking about um, the sound of the pie bill grieve. If you were to hear a, an eagle, and when you're watching movies and you see an eagle, you usually hear the red tail hawk, which I thought was kind of interesting. But I guess um, if you don't know what the sounds are, you're not really um, noticing it, but it's pretty cool. Did you, and did you know the bald eagles prefer to go after prey other birds, animals, and even humans catch over their own fishing? Um, they're just, it's easy for them just to grab and go. Uh, the red tail hawk can be found just about in every type of open habitat and mammals make up the most of their meals. Donna, my parents have um, a little bit of Sorry. land on the, on the water and they have a uh, bald eagle in one of their big trees out behind them and it's you, it almost makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you hear them. <laughs> um, it's, it's a little intimidating. They're, they're beautiful birds. Yeah, they're huge. Um, mm -hmm. I found a dead one at a reclamation. Someone had shot it and I got permission to mail it to the Eagle repository. And there it's, you don't realize how big their talons are, how big their beak is unless you could really see it up close. Um, and also in the oaks, which I love oaks. I think oaks are so undervalued and misunderstood and they so need to be protected and we've lost so many of them. Um, you'll be able to find this adorable bird, uh, the acorn woodpecker. They live in large groups and their social lives are just so fascinating. Um, they'll store thousands of acorns each year by jamming them into the holes in the trees. And uh, at um, Anderson or at Rodman, the, the granaries, the trees are huge. And it's amazing how they put these acorns in there. And then they, they're always around um, in their families. Their whole group families work together and in uh, Kate Marion's child's book, Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. She has a whole chapter on how um, socially active these guys are. Uh, yes. Also in the oaks, you're going to come across California scrub jays and white-breasted nuthatches. A group of jays has many collective nouns. Um, you can say there's a band of jays, a cast of jays, a party of jays, and a scold of jays. Um, and right now, I'm having a little bit of um, activity with all of the scrub jays. They're putting acorns in our bluebird boxes out at Rodman. So we've been cleaning those out, getting ready for nesting season. Oh, and the nut hatches, um, I put out a couple of peanuts every day and they'll come take a peanut. They're, they're very gentle birds. And a group of uh, nut hatches is called a jar. A jar of nut hatches. Not so exciting probably is our beautiful doves. Like all birds, morning doves are unable to sweat. So to stay cool in the hot weather, they pant like a dog. That's kind of something interesting to watch. And doves are one of the few species that drink by sucking up their water and taking, instead of taking the bill full of water and letting it trickle down their throats. And our, the men in our CTA group here might find this dove fact interesting. Morning dove nests are woven together by the female with materials collected by the male. The male supervises construction while standing on the back of the female while she works. And then we have the towhees from California and the spotted towhees. A group of towhees is collectively known as a tangle or a teapot. And um, something really cool about towhees is they're going to hop forward and backward on the ground. And it hops in reverse to scratch the leaf litter to find the food hidden underneath. 
And I saw one tohi with just a single leg and it can still hop back in and uncover its food. They like to eat insects like beetles, grasshoppers, crickets, wasps, and um, during the breeding season. And then in, um, right now in winter, they'll even go eat berries and acorns and different kinds of seeds. And another bird you see a lot of now are our golden crown and white crown sparrows. Uh, golden crowns are in huge numbers, especially at Rodman. I think uh, last time I was there, I counted like 50. And same with white crown sparrows. Uh, something interesting about the sparrows is they have an extra mouth bone that helps their tongue hold the seeds. If you sit there and watch them, they can manipulate that seed and crack it open. And a group of sparrows is called a host, a quarrel, or a knot. And we also have tons of house finches that will um, come to your seed feeders or um, water dishes. And um, house sparrows. House sparrows are probably not my favorite of birds, but that's mainly because I'm interested in getting our cavity nesters, our natives, um, let them have the cavities and house sparrows. They're opportunists. They can just nest just about anywhere. I won't talk about house sparrows too much, but I could tell you a lot. <laughs> and then um, we have groups of quail almost everywhere around that I've gone um, looking for seeds and berries. Most people know that the quail is your state bird. It's a beautiful bird and it's little top there is six little feathers on their head and they can be spotted in the open woodland streams and parks and all the places that I've listed that we would go birding. And then that was the end of one day. So busy of a day we had, but day two, we're just gonna take it easy and this is my back deck. We're gonna just kayak right off the back deck and go to um, the water and spend the day out just cruising around, getting up really close to all the birds and uh, go around Rattlesnake Island. And then if I had visitors that have come from out of town, I always, they're campers, I send them over to Clear Lake Campgrounds. And a couple times they've had um, motorhomes and stuff. And as I understand it, Lisa's gonna have an addition of motorboats coming in April, which will be extra exciting. And if you didn't have a place to launch your kayak, um, this is a great place to launch it from. I know people love it. Um, at and of course, you have to get out on the lake. A couple of ways to get on the lake besides our uh, Redbud Audubon um, uh, Heron Days tours is you can rent Eyes of the Wild boat tour. Uh, they'll get you out on the water. And uh, if you needed a place to stay in Clear Lake that is clean and safe, I've had family members stay at Clear Lake Cottages and Marina, and they loved it. Um, a neighbor, uh, Ed and Debbie Legan, they offer uh, boating trips to get you out on the water too. And people usually come from out of town to fish, which I don't fish, but they um, are great guides, especially for families. And here's just a couple of their recent pictures. And last year I took um, photos at the bass tournament. So it's interesting if you've never been around fish to see these huge things. And it's creepy because when I go swimming in the water, these guys are right out there with me. It's like, I, you know, it's kind of a weird feeling. I can't wait till I can start diving and see what I'm really around. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, this is just the view. Of, I kayak out, this is what I see from around the corner. There's a view right off my deck. And if we go up by grass field and look down, you're gonna see the view of the keys. And I think that's about all I have. Here's a list of our websites, Redbud Audubon, Anderson Marsh Interpretive Association, Clear Lake State Park and the Land Trust. And, um, I did, um, most all these are my pictures, except I did list other people's that I had um, use of their photos also. And I think that's about it.
fabulous, Donna. Oh Thank my you. gosh, that's great. It's, so, it's, not, it's not the same as taking you out awesome. in person, but then it's so busy. And if I ever go with anybody, you know, if I'm talking to you, looking at you, and then I look over there, it's because there's a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for letting me share. And so, does yeah, have any, any questions, Robert? Well, uh, Lisa Kahn, I believe is her name. For those of you that are on Instagram, she posts amazing bird photos. And How do you course, spell her last name? Uh, Kahn. K A H N. Okay. And and of course, uh, Ms. Pavoni takes yeah. incredible bird photos. Yeah. So Donna, I have a question. Um, you showed us beautiful birds. What's your favorite? Yeah, I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like right. Where, what, <laughs> what continent, what, I don't know. Um, <laughs> a bird that I see every day that I love. I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't say. I love all birds, except house sparrows. <laughs> <laughs> I live in, in the chaparral and I love the, the California Thrasher. They are oh, so yeah. damn cool. Yeah, with the you know, I guess I might say Fina Pepla because of the amazing repertoire and I can call them in and they always come um, and I always know where they are. But I don't know, we have affiliated woodpeckers here in the neighborhood too. I don't know, I can decide. Bad question. <laughs> <laughs> You're like your children, you can't show favorites. That's true. I want to just share a story. Um, as we watch the birds grow in our community, I, I've noticed I've been here a little over 20 years that we've just had more and more birds. I can walk out and in two or three minutes count about 10 species in my yard. But what I wanted to share with you is the last three years, I have at least a golden eagle visiting my yard every year. Wow. And they really don't seem to make a noise, but they collect a fish and I'm uphill from um, basically central Clear Lake. And they always land in a tree in my yard or go over, you know, one time it was right over me over the deck. And they don't, they weren't yelling, but the crows were chasing them always and yelling. So if you hear crows in a flock, and, and we have a flock of about 50 that live in my neighborhood that they just make so much noise. And I could see these crows coming at me uh, from my neighbor's yard. I have about three vacant lots. And it's like, what are the crows? And then I'm looking at it and I see this big bird and all I can see is the yellow. And I realize it's a bald eagle. And it was within about four feet of me going over. And so the birds are everywhere. You just have to open your eyes. So I just wanted to share that we all see those birds and the volume of birds really increasing. So thank yeah, we're you. Very lucky. We need to preserve our oak woodlands because without the oak woodlands and the insects, I can see in the future we'll have a problem. But right now, it's it's wonderful. And I think we do take it a little bit for granted how many we see every day, and I think we need to be more appreciative of of all of those. They're just so beautiful. We have, we often have friends visits from the Bay Area and you know who've never heard of Lake County or no idea what's up here who are birders and the only thing I can think of is why they have not spent time here before and how come no one's told them about this place because it really is Gay and I have birded all over the United States and the world and I have to tell you that I've never seen a place as rich in bird life as Lake County anywhere it's just wow. amazing. it really is truly an amazing place for well that's why we moved here. <laughs> yeah, that's why I retired here. I've been in three countries. For the birds and the kayaking. Birds and kayaking. That's why we came here. Absolutely. And we have not been disappointed. Awesome. Uh, this is Melissa, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I have to be on my, be on my phone. phone. Um, um, 
my property, my property in North Lakeport that I sold a couple of years ago because it was too big for me to take care of. Our home was on the top of a hill, and I looked out the, my kitchen window at the top of a very tall oak in which there was a nest that was there for at least 20 years. And every year, the red-tailed hawks would roost, raise their young, and fly off. Unfortunately, that was destroyed in a storm a couple of years ago. But I couldn't agree more with the birding possibilities for people to come here in Lake County. Uh, this is a recreational tourism attraction that we have not made the most of. That's and true. there's a little, yeah, there's a little town in Texas on the coast, on the Gulf, that is very, very small, smaller than even Lakeport. And yet every year for a week, they get thousands of visitors because of their burden. And um, not that we could accommodate thousands and thousands, but we really need to promote our birding much, much more. Um, I used to have, as I drove down my driveway to work, I used to have a blue heron always down there during certain times of the year. And it was wonderful, but lots and lots of birds. Now where I live in North Lakeport, and I put it in the chat, there are two osprey towers, I'll call them, that I have the benefit of watching as I drive to and from work. Awesome. Um, and it's wonderful to see this. So this has been a fabulous program. I truly appreciate it. So thank you so much. And thank you, Terry, for arranging this. And Robert, you were a fabulous, fabulous social director. And it's good to hear that you're going to be contributing and helping Terry with more programs. This okay. is very, very good. Thank you all. Yeah. This was fabulous. Okay, any more questions for Donna? No, I, the presentation I, I, is great, thank you. I have a thank question. You. Donna, I have a woodpecker that's trying to eat my house. <laughs> well, you, you have to and move, it, Robert, to his house. You gotta move. And it's, up on a, it's up on a high side of the house and I cannot get to it. And that. At seven o'clock every morning, it comes and it's banging on the side of my house. We had the netting down from the, from the roof, Robert. That's how we got rid of it. You really oh. want me to be on my roof? You crazy? Have you, have you tried helium balloons? No, I no. Go to the Dollar Tree and get helium balloons and let them up there, or those little hangy silver things. All right. Put them on a balloon. Maybe that'd work. I don't know. No, I had. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had the same problem in my house on Hill Road, and I bought a whole bunch of those little hanging silvery things that Donna just mentioned, and they do the trick because even in a whisper of a breeze, they twist and reflect, and I got rid of my crow problem, and oh, I had... Woodpecker problem. Yeah. I Teresa said flash tape. Flash tape works yeah, too. Flash tape. Yeah. Anything but you have to like wonder this? why is that woodpecker there? Do you have? I, I don't know, Donna. Pecker? I can't. I can't <laughs> see exactly. I, they, 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 they've gone away and then they come well, back. Well, it's well, like this is the third year that they've come back. They go away and then they come back. I guess they love you, Robert. Peckers. Well, yeah, that's nice. I, love <laughs> I, I loved Woody Woodpecker, but I really don't want to meet in my house. <laughs> I just yeah. want to add the fact that Lake County in fall, winter, and spring, that's when we have the birds. Mm -hmm. So we're not just a summer place for people to visit. But... Yeah. Fall, winter, and spring is when the birds are here. 
And, and I, I want to say it. something about the algae problem. You know, people say you know, they don't want to be in the water because the algae. Trust me, birders do not care about going through algae. They'll go through, well, worse than that to see a bird. Trust me. That's why you <laughs> see people are burning at reclamation ponds. You know, it's a lot worse than algae. They don't care. But, I mean, it's, we would, I took a couple of my birder friends kayaking in Atlantis and Marsh one year. It was a while back where the algae was really bad that year. And it had packed in. And it stunk. And then they, they, they didn't even occur to them to worry about it. They were just going right through there because there was a bird on the other side they wanted to see. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it really is, uh, I mean, if, I think we would be inundated with people if, people if the birders understood really how rich the birds are. Right. But one of the places also just in the Bay Area that for birds that you should never miss is Schellenberger Park in Petaluma. Yeah. It is yeah. extraordinary. It's right by the river. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it has to do with the, uh, the treatment plant, and it's just incredible, uh, this, the, all of the wildlife. I mean, there's otters and all kinds of things there, but I, I, I mean, I, my office was in Petaluma for 30 years, and that place is incredible. If you ever have a chance, go to Schollenberger. I have a question. This is Cindy. Okay. Um, Sorry, I don't have my video on tonight because I was trying to catch up on some things around the house while I was listening. Um, but I'm wondering, have you heard any updates on the salmon and leosis situation with the pine siskins? Yes, um, and they might they are still migrating through here. When we received word that they are, um, it's like every other year you have huge bursts of flocks that migrate through. And when they do, they're so susceptible to the salmonella. Um, we recommended that you bring in all your bird feeders. Don't feed any sunflower. Uh, if you have water out there, you know, clean that really good, bleach it every couple days, because if it gets uh, on, if you have one uh, infected bird with salmonella, it gets on it. It goes to the bathroom, another bird steps it, another bird eats it. It can wipe out hundreds of pine siskins in days. Um, they can be dead within 24 hours of contamination. Um, I haven't counted any pine siskins at all in the past three days, so I put a feeder out and I didn't have any, just goldfinches. Well, we have tons of pine siskins at our feeders every day. I mean, tons. Oh. And I've so, never seen one drop down in Lake County right now. They're all at our place. They're coming from the marsh across the creek. This is really an outbreak year. We've had 30 times more this year than we've ever had before. Uh, I know oh. National is recommending that everyone not feed just till they pass through. Because if you are feeding, of course, they're going to stay longer. But if you move in your feed, they'll just keep on going to where they're supposed to go. Anyone else? So I have another question, Donna. Um, for Facebook social media, who should, as CTAs, who should we be following? Um, the I, write, I write the Redbud Audubon post. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, like today I wrote that the, we have rare bird alerts and there was a grasshopper sparrow found out at um, Anderson Marsh. And so that was yeah. my post for today. Fabulous. Okay, so everyone go like the Redbud Audubon Society on Facebook. Oh, and then of course, Kim Riley's um, visit Kelseyville is outstanding. Yes. Okay, perfect. Donna, thank you so much. This was fabulous. Yeah. Yes, Donna. Great. Thank you. That really was awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, can I um, ask a question? Yes, Stephanie, okay. go ahead. Okay, my question is, is that I see people always feeding the ducks over at the way. And um, I met this, uh, this family that just bought a house here with their kids, and there are so many birds there. I mean, it's just not abundant. And, but she wants to feed her brothers, so it's not a good idea. So what can I advise them to get? It's a little deaf girl. And what can we give her to feed the ducks? Could you repeat that, Michelle? I couldn't hear it all. Hmm. 
basically the part that I got is what can she suggest to a little girl to feed ducks? Ah. Oh. Henry, you want to take that? I yeah, don't don't feed the ducks. <laughs> That's the answer. You do not. We've got a problem in our, right on our channel. The, the kids across the way or the dock are feeding the ducks. You will have a hundred ducks, maybe more, and they're all and they're all become dependent. As soon as they see a person, they run. So as soon as they see the duck hunters, they're going to run toward their boats, and they all get shot. And uh, because they learn that people are safe, it's it's never a good idea to feed wild birds. And, Especially not ducks. Well, if you're gonna feed them, you don't want to feed them bread. You want to feed them oats, things like yeah, green. Yeah, but bread. It's, it's a problem because people feed them and yes. they they get bonded on. They see people as a food source, and especially generations of them will do it. And then the the youngs don't learn how to feed for themselves. People stop feeding them and they starve to death. So we have a, fifty. We have fifty of them that come to eat up the seed yeah. that our other birds don't eat, and they fly up and. We have like 50 or 60 ducks suddenly. This started, I'm, I'm blaming the children across the way totally. But they, they started <laughs> feeding them. They stopped feeding them. And so now they're, now they're cleaning the ground under my bird feeders. About 50 at a time. I can't get rid of them. So, oh, well. Yeah. I think you should feed the dogs instead. Feed the dogs. Yes. Yeah, feed the dogs. <laughs> okay, perfect. Donna, thank you again. So just as we're ending, I just wanted to reiterate our mission statement for CTA for Lake County. Create an awesome visitor experience, increase economic impact, and build a positive destination image. So yes. all of that obviously includes birding. So go <laughs> out there and share that CTA love, everybody. We'll see you guys soon. We'll post when our next social is going to be in March. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the program. It's great. Thanks, Gay and Henry. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.